Coming up on this week's show, we talk about daddy issues with Seth King. Welcome to the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for readers and writers of gay romance fiction. If you can read it, write it, watch it, or listen to it, these two guys are going to talk about it. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Adams and Will Knaus. Welcome to episode 141 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. I'm Jeff from jeffadamswrites.com. And I'm Will from willknaus.com. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by our remarkable group of supporters on Patreon. Uh, We want to send a great big thank you to Grey Wolf. Uh, He joined us this past week. We'll have more information on how you can join Grey Wolf and all of our... Other great patrons. Thank you. uh, In just a few moments. Ah, here we are. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a great week. Uh, I spent it being very warm in Texas, uh, out on a work trip, uh, and missing my husband. Aww. It was good to come home on Friday. Uh, how was your week? Fine. Nothing of note. I mean, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll talk about some of the things I was doing uh, in just a few minutes. Absolutely. Uh, I do want to point our listeners off to a piece of flash fiction uh, that got published of mine this week. Uh, Kimmer's Erotic Book Banter is doing some Pride Flash fiction, and I was very pleased to uh, and honored to be asked to join the authors who are participating in that. My piece called This Way Out, about a boy's first kind of stepping his toes out of the closet, uh, went up this past Friday. So I will link to that in the show notes, should anybody be interested to check that out. Fantastic. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Now, this past week was the Tony Awards. Uh, it aired on Sunday. Uh, we weren't able to watch it and, and, and critique it uh, for last week's episode. <laughs> um, what were your general thoughts? Generally, I thought it was a really good episode. A good episode. A good telecast this year. Uh, Sarah Bareilles and Josh Groban hosted. I thought they did a tremendous job. Uh, they were fun. Uh, they both are Tony nominated, but have not won. And apparently they haven't won anything. I would have thought, I was surprised that Josh hasn't even won a Grammy. So, uh, I loved their, they did a song that was to Sia's chandelier that was about having to sing eight times a week, uh, which was really delightful. And, uh, it gave me all the feels that, uh, Sarah showed a picture of her Humboldt County performance as Fern in Charlotte's Web. I saw that with my mom, and it was also the very first time that I saw this guy on a stage, although it was two years later before we ever got together uh, for the first time. But uh, yeah, so that gave me all the feels, too. And super psyched for our New York trip that's coming up, uh, Mm -hmm. because now that we've seen a sampling of everything, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. What were your thoughts? I also thought it was (laughs) a really terrific telecast this year. Uh, Lots of great performances. Uh, I thought Josh and Sarah did a wonderful job job yeah please have them back tony people because they were (laughs) all kinds of awesome we want to quickly congratulate jan she won the ebook of running with lions by julian winters that we gave away in episode 139 congratulations jan the code name winger series celebrates pride month with a limited time sale throughout the month of june the first book Tracker Hacker is just 99 cents at all online retailers. It's the perfect chance to begin the adventures of Theo Reese, high school student, hockey player, computer genius, and covert agent who goes by the codename Winger. The second thrilling installment, Schooled, is also available and coming this fall, Audio Assault continues Theo's high-tech missions. Love Bites Reviews says, Jeff Adams has a brilliant writing style for YA that draws you in. Add the code name Winger series to your Pride Month reading list before the sales ends on June 30th. Get more information at codenamewinger.com. So while I was traveling on the plane this week, uh, I took a moment to finish off the NBC series Rise. I talked about this a few episodes back when it first made its premiere on NBC in the spring. Uh, It's about a high school drama department in the rather, let's say, struggling town of Stanton, Pennsylvania. They've lost their steel mill and they're still grappling with the economics around that. And it's about this drama teacher uh, who takes over the school's drama department and wants to do Spring Awakening to kind of jolt the town out out of its... 
kind of slumbers a little bit and to show the kids kind of everything that musical theater can do for them. Uh, at the time, I said it was more like the 1980 movie Fame and some of its grittiness and not so much high school musical or Glee, for example. And, and that very much maintained itself throughout the, uh, the run of the series. Uh, but I found this series to be really just extraordinary in its presentation of really life today in a struggling town uh, with the kids who all have their dreams and potentially their parents who've been so kind of rung through the ringer that they don't necessarily know how to help their kids get those dreams and the power and what the power of musical theater can actually do to or creativity of any time can do to kind of pull you out of that and show you what the world can be and maybe what you can do for the world. There was a great uh, transgender storyline that ran through the season. Uh, a young man's also coming to terms with that, the fact that he is likely gay uh, was also running through there. The performances of Spring Awakening and those songs were really good and really fit into this uh, world very nicely. And I really enjoyed the series. I get why it did not succeed because it was not a shiny, happy Disney musical thing. Uh, but if you're into something a little more gritty and real, and for example, if you like that 1980 movie fame, go check out Rise. It's still on NBC.com. You can check out those episodes, I suspect, until the fall season actually starts. Or it's also on uh, Hulu, and I'll put some links in the show notes for that. Really ace performances all around. Rosie Perez, in particular, was just really awesome. And uh, yeah, so I highly recommend it if you're looking for something to binge watch over the summer. Cool. I quickly wanted to mention the June 15th issue of Entertainment Weekly. It is their annual LGBTQ issue, uh, and Pose is on the cover. This is your weekly reminder to watch Pose on FX every Sunday. Yes. Love the show to pieces. This is a wonderful article. Uh, talks to Ryan Murphy and uh, his producing partner about how they got the show up and running. Uh, talks about the fantastic cast. Uh, and everyone involved and some of their ideas uh, and their hopes and dreams for the show moving forward. It's a really great article. Highly recommend you check it out. This issue, issue might still be on the stands when this uh, particular episode of the podcast goes live. Potentially, so, yeah. So if this hasn't made it to uh, the inside of your mailbox, uh, go check out your local drugstore or newsstand. They might still have a copy or two. Also, I know a lot of people were really, really excited for this issue because it was uh, a, they had a QAF uh, reunion on its inside pages. Uh, I'm now showing the uh, center spread of yeah. well, the entire cast of QAF all, all lounging about like they're on the cover <laughs> of Vanity Fair. <laughs> That's exactly um, what that looks like. <laughs> uh, everyone is still uh, gorgeous and amazing. Uh, they have a short article talking about uh, their reminiscences and the importance of QAF and all of that and mm -hmm. the, the fandom that uh, is still around. Everyone still loves this show. Uh, so I highly recommend you check out EW if you uh, haven't had a chance. Uh, really quickly, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, I was on my own this week while Jeff was in the scorching climes of Texas. Um, I stayed indoors and watched a couple of movies. The first one I checked out was Paris is Burning, since I'm on a ballroom crazed binge at the moment. Um, the classic Paris is Burning is, of course, the 1990 documentary uh, about the ballroom scene in New York. Uh, it, of course, served as the basis for the series Pose, and um, the movie still holds up. I love this movie an awful, awful lot. Um, it's very real, very gritty, uh, a lot more grittier than the than Pose. Mm -hmm. uh, New, <laughs> New York has changed a lot in 30 years. Uh, and they can, like, <laughs> when when they shoot it in, on Pose, when they shoot a scene in Washington Square Park, they can, like, you know, throw some newspapers and some trash around, but it ain't <laughs> nearly as gritty as it really, truly was. Um, uh, and Paris is Burning, you know, proves it. It was uh, pretty rough back then. Uh, though the movie came out in 1990, uh, the majority of the interviews and footage was... Uh, shot in 1987 uh, and like I said it follows the ballroom scene um, and it sort of serves as a primer they they uh, kind of take you step by step 
uh, through what the process is and they explain some of the lingo. Um, so it's sort of ballroom 101. <laughs> um, one of my favorite parts of the movie is uh, Dorian Corey. She basically spends the entire movie uh, sitting in front of a mirror, putting on her face, tossing out these genius like bon mots, these, <laughs> these beautiful little nuggets of gay wisdom. She's like a, a, a beautiful transgender Yoda. But she, <laughs> but she, she doesn't have to like talk in like backwards double speak. She just tells it completely like it is. And I love Doreen Corey so much. I highly recommend uh, uh, Paris is Burning. If you haven't seen it or, or haven't seen it in a while, it still holds up. It's really fantastic. It's currently streaming on Netflix. And also, uh, slightly related, I finally checked out Strike a Pose. Pose. See what I worked in there? You did. I did. This is all about pose. <laughs> a strike of pose is the 2016 documentary um, following up the dancers that uh, appeared in Madonna's Blonde Ambition tour. Oh wow! I didn't uh, even know that existed. Uh, yeah, it's an amazing movie. It came out a couple of years ago in uh, uh, in celebration of the 25th anniversary of Truth or Dare. Okay. Which came out in 1991. Um, so basically, the m- movie um, talks to all of the remaining dancers and kind of fills us in on what it was like being cast for primarily for the Vogue video. All of the dancers in the Vogue video eventually went on to join Madonna on tour uh, for Blonde Ambition. And they talked about what that experience was like. Uh, and then they also talk about the experience, um, what the intense media scrutiny was like when Truth or Dare came out Mm -hmm. after that. Um, They cover some of the uh, topics um, that were present at the time in the very early 90s uh, and some of the uh, boundary-breaking things uh, that Truth or Dare did. There was the on-screen kiss between the two dancers. They were... Uh, talked openly about HIV and uh, AIDS prevention and uh, a, a lot of different topics that were uh, very important. And I think what um, what this first part of Strike a Pose does is it really makes us, you know, take a look back and realize um, things were very different in 1991. They mm-hmm. were still very, very difficult. Um <sighs> For the gay community. Uh, so it looked at that. Then it followed up with everyone uh, in the intervening years about what they were doing, how they were living, how they were surviving, uh, whether they were still dancing or not. Um, so I really enjoyed this documentary an awful, awful lot. It was wonderful to see them all again and see what they've been up to. The movie sort of wraps up with a reunion in an L.A. Uh, restaurant. Um, oh, cool. So, say the, so the, it's, it's really genuinely emotional when they all see each other again after, you know, 20 plus years. Uh-huh. Um, my only quibble with the movie is that they all sit down and they share a meal. Uh, and it comes off a teensy bit, like, stagey. Mm. Like the director says, okay, now this is when you all give us sound bites about what the themes of this movie is about. <laughs> so that wasn't my favorite, favorite part, but I still think Strike a Pose is worth checking out, uh, especially uh, if you enjoyed uh, Madonna's Blonde Ambition tour like I did. I, rem- I, had, I had a Blonde Ambition poster on my door as a kid. I remember that I had, <laughs> I had people over to watch the tour when it was on HBO. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it didn't come... That was a big, big deal. That was a big deal. Huge Because it deal. didn't come anywhere near... <laughs> right, it might exactly. have played Atlanta. Yeah. Maybe. Because 91, yeah. I was... I was just graduated college in 91. Mm-hmm. And it might have been to Atlanta, but odds are I wasn't going to go to the effort to try and get tickets for that. Because that's almost... I think that's pre-internet. I think you still had to, like, go stand in your line to buy the tickets. You had to call on the telephone. Or or stand in line at the... <laughs> At the at the mall to get into where they were selling the tickets. Exactly, <laughs> but yeah, Blonde Ambition was a big deal, yeah. and I did have some very closeted crushes on some of those dancers mm-hmm. uh, in the in the, on that tour. Yeah, I, I still because that was the tour that had 
We're going to have a divergent moment here, podcast <laughs> listeners. That was the tour that opened with Express Yourself, right? Oh, yes, it yeah. did. Yes, it did. That that was more hot to me than Vogue ever was. <laughs> Express Yourself was the video that I was like gaga for. Yeah. All that summer. Uh, so yeah, we'll stop talking about Madonna now. Uh, <laughs> so I got a couple books to talk about. Um, well, tell us all about it. In preparation to talk to Seth King, which will be coming up on here in a few minutes, I read two very different types of his work. He, as we'll talk about in the interview, writes whatever he wants, basically. He, he'll, he'll hop all over the spectrum. He doesn't necessarily write straight up romance all the time. Uh, he'll get in there to some angsty emotional issues. And I really, between honesty and twinkle toes, I was all over the place um, in, in the stuff that he writes. And I loved both of these books for very different reasons. Uh, for honesty, uh, this is a book that he uh, is quite autobiographical for him. Uh, and we'll talk about that too. Uh, this is a story about Cole Furman, and the whole book is told in his point of view. Uh, and his uh, rather stormy relationship with Nick Flores, or as they term themselves, Coley and Nikki. Uh, they live in a conservative uh, northern Florida town. Uh, Cole knows very well that he's gay, but he isn't out. He's not comfortable being out in this environment. He knows his family will have big issues with it. Uh, but Nick is even deeper in the closet than he is. Uh, he, he doesn't stand up for Cole at all when Cole is called names at the gym. Uh, doesn't even has issues really being seen with Nick anywhere or sorry, seen with Cole anywhere ever. Um, but they can't kind of escape this pull that they've got on each other. Uh, Cole is drawn to Nick's galaxy eyes as he calls them. And that's, I love the stuff that, uh, that Seth does around Nick's eyes and how those are the kind of the touchstone for Cole, uh, and what he, what he sees the possibility of what they can be. It's all kind of in Nick's eyes. Uh, and Nick is equally fascinated with the possibilities in the world that Cole kind of shows him um, as they kind of test the waters on being around each other. Um, it's such a tumultuous on-again, off-again summer romance. Uh, Cole more and more wants to create a life with Nick, but Nick cannot find the way to do that um, because he's truly... A terrified young adult. These two are both 19 uh, during the time of this book. Um, Seth really, he puts all the feels in this book as you bounce around with Cole being happy and sad to being angry and it, it bounces all over the place. Um, this is not a romance. Don't go into it thinking it's a romance. There's some very deeply romantic elements here, but it does not follow the rules of the game at all. Uh, and the ending of the book is really heartbreaking. Uh, and it's even more heartbreaking when you realize that this still happens today in 2018 in places in the Deep South, in very conservative communities, in very conservative families. Because you could live in New York but have a really conservative family and still go through some of the same things these two can go through in this book. Uh, but I tell you, Seth just really brings all the power to this book and it was a it was a satisfying albeit tough read and if that's kind of your jam you should definitely go pick up this book um now twinkle toes on the other hand is just a wonderful over-the-top comedy uh there's no other word for it um this came out right after the olympics this year and it features andy robbins who's an out figure skater who picked up a silver medal at the games uh, and there's a certain high-ranking vice president who's pushing to get a meeting with Andy, and Andy keeps refusing and giving off wonderful quips in the media about why he will not meet with this man, period. Um, after Andy wins his event, he ends up meeting speed skater Gus Sanchez, and these two embark on a friendship that rapidly becomes a lot more and becomes kind of the focus of some Olympics uh, coverage uh, that happens. Um, it's so easy. I mean, you could probably tell just by my description here that this is, uh, that Andy is kind of based on Adam Rippon, although it was at, is it, it's as if Adam's personality is amped up by about 2 million percent, uh, which makes this wonderfully funny. And you cannot help but see that Gus Kenworthy is probably, uh, the, the, the model for Gus Sanchez as if Adam and Gus's Olympic friendship might've gone down a different path. Uh, this is a cute, 
funny, funny, funny biting um, novella from Seth. Uh, and I, I found it a delight. I truly did. And it's it was cool to see. I actually read this first. So it was fun to see the comedic side of Seth before going into some of the emotional depths that Honesty had. So yeah, two from uh, from Seth that I, I highly recommend uh, you giving a read to to check him out if you have it already. Great. Now, if these books sound interesting to you, all you have to do is check out the show notes page for links in order to purchase them. Uh, any link that you use uh, on our website is an affiliate link, which means that we get a few pennies if you choose to purchase said books. Now, there is more than one way to help support this podcast. One other way is to join us on Patreon. Now, you can help support the show uh, with a monthly pledge through Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Your pledge pays for the cost of producing and distributing this show. Now, for fans who pledge at the silver and gold levels, you'll have the exclusive opportunity to ask questions of our upcoming guests. You'll also have the option to have a personalized thank you sent directly to you at home. From us to you. Yes. Grey Wolf just took advantage of that, in fact. <laughs> Any month that our pledges cover our monthly production costs, we will record a special bonus episode, especially for our patrons. And... Our Pride Month bonus episode is just around the bend. Yep. Uh, we've got a lot of great um, comments and quips from some of our pasts and upcoming guests. Yeah, we uh, this month we asked our guests uh, what Pride means to them and got such a wonderful collection of answers. So yeah, if you're joining us on Patreon... Uh, you'll be able to see this episode coming up on uh, this Tuesday. Yes. As always, you can find out more at patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash biggayfictionpodcast. Did you know that podcasts love to get reviews too? Taking a moment to leave a review about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast helps us with the show's visibility online please take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a review. Your comments help other readers of gay romance discover this show. Thanks for helping us spread the word about the Big Gay Fiction Podcast. So after your enthusiastic endorsement of Seth King's books, how about we actually talk to the man himself? Yes, I got to talk to him this week. Uh, we talked about his latest book, Daddy Issues, and then of course we also talked about Honesty and Twinkle Toes and a whole bunch of other good stuff. So let's get to that. I'm excited to welcome Seth King to the podcast. Seth has a very simple bio. He enjoys reading, writing, traveling, and spending time with his family. His latest book is the second in the Daddy Issue series, entitled Who's Your Daddy? Welcome, Seth. Thank you for having me. Who do you have there with you? For those who are on the video, me. anyway. Yeah. She's kind of my daughter, so she whatever I do, she does. So she's just here with me. Excellent. She may have some answers to some of these questions, then. Hopefully. <laughs> so tell us about this new book, Who's Your Daddy, and, and the Daddy Issue series in general. Um, it, the Nexus is a guy who falls in love with his mom's ex-husband. Uh, it came about from a bunch of different things, um, one of which happened to be a an adult film that I saw. I was sort of intrigued by the plot. But also a, a guy who... I'm 28, and a guy I was talking to was having 43, and there were a lot of different sort of things that came up, questions he had, and sort of differences that we had, and so those two things sort of came together and gave birth to daddy issues, and the sequel was sort of, my the characters just didn't stop talking in my head, um, call it schizophrenia, call it being an author, call it whatever you want, but they sort of become your friend, and they sort of live in, on your shoulder. Uh, and they wouldn't stop talking, so I continued it. And that's basically what the sequel is. Do you see more coming in that series? Uh, with any of my books, really. Uh, once I write them, once you spend that much time, it sounds pretentious, but once you spend that much time inside their minds and once you spend that much time, like weeks or months with people, characters, but I think of, of them as people, um, they live in your head forever. So with honesty or with straight or with any of my books or series, 
you can always sort of go back into that mode and turn it on and find out where they are and what they're doing. And I know it sounds crazy and it sounds just like mumbo jumbo author nonsense, but <laughs> with any of my books or characters, really, they sort of, they have a shelf life. Like they live inside of my head. And like I was thinking about honesty the other day and thinking about what he was doing and I could write that right now. It's just a matter of logistics and telling my brain to shut up because I have so many ideas and you know, there's too many, but yeah, any any sequel is kind of the same. It's just the voices don't stop. How much do you plan kind of in advance what you're writing, I, or is it more like spur of the moment, I'm going to write this I right literally, now? I remember when I was doing schoolwork, my teachers would come to my desk and tell me, Seth, you can't do that. You can't jump around this way. You can't just start writing without a plan. It doesn't work with anyone. It's not going to work with you. You have to draft. You have to plan. I remember with math problems, I would jump from the first to the last and in the middle I've always been that way. I don't know why it works, but it works somehow. I sit down at my desk and open up a file and start writing. And I come out. That's just how I am. I'm a very chaotic thinker, like pinball machine, basically. So if I try to outline, I don't even think it would work because that's not how I've ever been successful. Mm -hmm. There's no rhythm. There's no like, there's no method to anything. And I, I've heard of other, you know, hardcore so-called pantsers. Uh, who, who that's the only way they can go. And I kind of envy that because it means you're just kind of getting the story as it, as it just flows out of you. Uh, well, literally, yeah. Literally, like, I, I, remember specific, I remember straight the characters came to me. Well, I think I was washing my hands right over there. Um, and people just started talking and things started happening. And sometimes it's, it, it's like that. It just starts. I don't know really. It's, I, like I said, it sounds crazy, but... It really is like it just falls into your head sometimes. I remember that I wrote that book in 19 days, and it's usually not like that. It's usually harder. But um, that book came to me like somebody was whispering in my ear. Oh, I wish it was always that easy, don't you? Oh, it's not always. Trust me, right now it's not so easy. <laughs> now, I think most people know you or, or got introduced to you with 2016's Honesty, uh, which – is really such an emotional roller coaster. Was that, I know there's autobiographical elements to that. Was that cathartic to write it or difficult to write? It was cathartic in the moment because I was writing out what was actually happening. I was in love with a guy whose family was very religious and literally would not let him be gay. They told him that they found a text message from me, it was my boyfriend of like two years, and they told him, You are not gay. That's not a real thing. Gay people are confused you need to meet the right girl and this guy Seth has somehow tricked you into thinking that you like guys when you don't. So that's what I was dealing with while I was writing that book. And also while I was writing it, nobody in the world knew that I was dating a guy. I was we were both closeted and, and going around as friends. So there were so many elements in it. When I read it now it's like literally just a cry straight from my soul. Like it there's I can sense so much anguish and everything in it, but that book was how I came out. To everyone, but when I wrote that book, my own parents didn't know that I was dating a guy. And that when I released it on release day, was, there was an article related to it, but that's how I came out. So looking back at it, it's like, oh my god, it's a rush of emotion, just like straight up, like heroin in your veins, emotion. So it's, it's crazy for me to even pick up the book now. That's brave to, to have that be the company. you would say brave. Looking back, I think it's just insanity because I didn't know. I'm from a very conservative town. I know a lot of people aren't, but I happen to be. 87% um, of my county is registered Republican, and not that that means anything, but it does here. But um, it looks, it, it's insane looking back. Like, I lost siblings. I lost immediate family members forever because of coming out and because of that book. One of my brothers, we've barely spoken since then because I came out in such a public way. Like I, but in the back of my mind, I knew if I do this, my life will change forever. Like anyone coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, when people come out, they know that you can't go back from that. And some people will drop you. And it's like, it opened my life up and I would never go back and change it. But at the same time, releasing that book changed a lot of things for me. And my brother has, I've, I've had five conversations with him in the three years since it came out. So people say it gets better and it does in a lot of ways, but I like to say it gets different because you can never sort of forecast or foresee what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. 
So but that's another reason why that book is so special to me because it represents such a shift in my life. It literally from one day to the next day, my life changed. And I think it's a, unfortunately, still a relevant story today for some of the uh, the younger audience in that. In I think it always will be. Yeah. I don't. I think yeah. Acceptance. Not to interrupt you, like I keep doing. Sorry, but um, I just like to talk. But I think acceptance is such a regional, case by case, town by town, state by state thing. A lot of people like to say, "Oh, I live in New York and it's fine here," and it is, and that's great. But there are so many people in different places that don't have that and aren't like that. My in my town. I went to a school, there were 600 people in my grade, and there was one openly gay student out of 600. I remember two girls were walking through the hallway holding hands. They were dating. They identified as bisexual. And our principal called their parents and told them to stop because it was creating such a rough. Like, it's crazy to think even, that was even only 10 years ago. I graduated 10 years ago this week in 2008. But it's crazy to think that even 10 years ago this was happening, you know? So... Yeah, I don't, that was a tangent, but um, it's interesting just how specific everything is. There's no one size fits all thing to acceptance. Well, for sure. And I mean, I don't, a lot of it can be regional, uh, but even in New York where it's safe to be out, you could certainly have family who makes it not safe. Totally. So, and that's why I think that book, even though it's rough, and as I told you before we record it and I'll actually review it before we get into the interview portion and the actual show. But I mean, it's both, it's a, it's a, it's a important book to read and it's a good book to read, but man, it's tough to read in well, some places I, with all the, my other, before I was a writer, I was just a book lover in general, a, a reader. And I never sort of did like, I never cared about happiness in my books. Like I loved, um, cheer jerkers and weebies, like, so when I read a book, I never really was like, oh, I, I wonder if it's H-E-A, not that you are, but in my own personal life, like I kind of like that. Like um, I just read Night about, uh, I think, Auschwitz and, you know, movies like Titanic or like, I sort of, I have a thing for tragedy. I just watched a Amy Winehouse documentary about her sort of self-destruction and I'm fascinated by that. Like the fairy tale is great for me, but I also, I'm fascinated by when the fairy tale falls apart and where it all goes wrong. So Mm -hmm. and I'm the same way I don't need every book to finish in the HEA or an HFN if it, tell me a good story oh I know what you mean though honesty is brutal because it is I feel like it's real and I feel like I've had a lot of gay people specifically just email me and be like I felt this like I live this this is I, this is my life you know so I, I get it it's, it's brutal it's not fun what got you started as a writer um I don't remember because I have been doing it since I knew I, I knew what writing was. I remember when I was three or four, my mom remembers um, we were riding home from school, from pre-K, wherever it was, and I looked at her and I said, um, I'm going to be an author one day. And she sort of remembers when I said it, she just looked at me and said, like, okay, whatever. Um, and But from then on, it was just sort of almost an obsession. It was relentless just this is what I wanted and this is there are a lot of wrong turns and stuff but I don't know how but I just always knew because my, my what I got my purest joy from was telling a story and sort of just taking people from point A to point B and entertaining them and just making them feel things I whether it was telling a joke or writing a story or telling a story in front of the class I just liked to tell stories and I think that's sort of where it came from and combined the love of books, and it all just came together. That's awesome. I like that it goes back that far. Since, since I can remember, yeah. My mom told me, she, my parents thought something was wrong with me because it was my only pursuit. Like, I, my grandpa bought me an iMac, one of those really old, ugly, like, the iMac computers with the green panels and the white panels, that, like, shaped like an egg. Yep. Anyway, my grandpa bought one of those for me at a garage sale, and I spent my whole sixth grade summer writing in my bedroom writing a, a memoir about my family and one of 18 children. Um, and it was called Mixed Blessings, which was terrible. But I didn't even really have much of a childhood because I always wanted this. So it's crazy, but I just knew. Well, to do a memoir at, at, in sixth grade, that's 
That's it. Well, it was mostly about, because everyone would ask me, they didn't care about me, they didn't care about, they wouldn't ask me about my name, they wouldn't say, how are you? They would say, you're the kid with the family. So I knew that it, I sort of wanted to explain it myself because uh, I was one of 18 kids, they were adopted from eight different countries around the world, and since that was what I was known for, that's all anyone cared about, I just started writing about it. That's definitely I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to see right now, it's probably terrible. <laughs> But do you still have it on a floppy disk? That's the important question. I have to print it out. Print it out works too. That way you've at least got it. Yeah. You were doing, do you have writing before Honesty. What was, what were those books? Um, one of my biggest books was before that actually was about the death of my older brother. But um, the biggest difference is just that they were hetero. I had never, because I dated women when I was a teenager. Um, in the early 20s, but honestly, it was the first time that I, I guess, was honest or just was writing about, it was also the first guy I dated. Um, it was just the first time I explored that in in my books, my writing. Mm -hmm. What turned the corner for you to become a published writer? When were you like, this is the thing I want to put out into the world finally? I don't remember. Um, I, like I said, I just knew what I wanted, and I, I just never had another plan. I remember sort of all my friends going off to college and starting their lives and getting married and getting jobs at you know corporations or sort of the A, B, and C plan. And I remember a few times just thinking, this has to work out. I don't have another option. So I got really, really serious when I was about 23, 24, 25, and got here. And you're a full-time writer these days, right? Yes. That's awesome. More than full-time. I say full life because it doesn't end. Yeah. That's awesome. Congratulations on that because that's, that's very cool. Who are some of your inspirations for your writing? My inspiration, I've always studied Ernest Hemingway's writing because I can get very wordy, if you didn't notice. <laughs> uh, he has a very pared down, simple way of writing that I, if I meet him halfway, that's good for me because I cut out a lot of the fluff. Um, right now I'm reading the new David Sedaris. He's one of my all time favorite writers. Um, he's always been openly gay and openly what he is. And I just think he's a genius. I read his books over and over again. Um, Amy Krul, the, uh, the woman who wrote Brokeback Mountain is my favorite, one of my favorite writers also. She writes short stories. Um, Virginia Highsmith, who wrote The Price of Salt. She's one of my favorite queer works of fiction. Um, she wrote it in the 50s when it was illegal to write gay narratives. It was like you would get censored. So she wrote it under a pseudonym, and nobody even knew she wrote it until she died in the 90s. But it was remade into that movie Carol with uh, Kate Blanchett. Mm -hmm. But that's one of my favorite books ever, and it's just such a good chronicle of like that first obsessive gay love that you have, which I'm sure everyone has had. Um, so yeah, I, I usually look back in history for people who wrote before it was okay. Like, like I said, like a lot of these people were writing when it was literally illegal. So I don't know. I mean, I'm still learning the gay classics. I, never, I haven't read the Velvet Rage. I'm still learning the gay because I was afraid until a few years ago. I would not have bought a book, a gay book in a bookstore because I was afraid. So um, I'm still catching up on that. I'm still learning. And there's a lot of good stuff out there for sure to, to catch up on. Uh, what do you think the trademark of a Seth King book is? Uh, most people will probably say tears, but I, what I like to do is just take people on a ride. I, I, like my favorite movies are sort of big epics, like I said, Titanic or stories where you feel everything, where you might cry and then you're thrilled and you're on the edge of your seat and you learn something and I like to sort of run the gamut of everything. So I, you know what I mean? I, that's, those are the books I read in my spare time, and that's what I want to do to people. I want them to, I want to take them out of their lives, and also when they leave the book, I want them to just leave maybe a little bit different, or learning something, or just having had an experience. Mm -hmm. And I certainly have had the kind of a breadth of some of your writing because before I read Honesty, I picked up that novella Twinkle Toes, which is a totally different tone, kind of like Adam Rippon on steroids. 
if you will, and, 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 yeah, and kind of that over the topness. And it was a totally delightful, funny little kind of just a whimsical read to have, especially right well, after the Olympics. Thank you, first of all. But that's another thing. A lot of authors feel sort of closed in by the genre they choose. I'm not ever going to be like that because I, number one, I don't want to ever lose the joy of writing. Sitting down, taking out, I was going to say picking up your pen, but it's not picking up your pen. I never want to lose the joy of opening up a word file and just writing. I want to always remember and know how happy it makes me and I never want to lose that. So if, I, if an idea comes into my head, I'll write it and I'll enjoy it and I won't think about, hmm, I wonder what market this will hit or if my readers who like this book will like that book or, you know, at the end of the day, I want to keep the process joyful and I want to write what makes me happy. So I'll, I definitely switch around and, and pinball around, but most of all it's because I want, I want to keep my brain sharp, number one, and also I just... I'm also sort of, I like everything, like, when I'm not writing, I'll watch Real Housewives, and then I'll listen to a podcast about, like, neuroscience, or all, not that I'm an intellectual, but I, I like different things, and I like to keep my mind sort of fresh and open to new things, so yeah, right now I'm writing a super depressing thing about, well, I was suicidal at one point, um, well, I've been open about that, uh, I'm writing sort of something drawn from that, and I'm also writing a total, a totally, like, happy, dishy beach read. So I think it's important for any artistically minded person to write what you want to write, write what what makes you happy and, and keep up the joy in it. Because I never want to sit down at my desk and think like, oh, not again, you know, like I, I like enjoying my job. Yeah, I think that would certainly come across in the writing too. If it was like, oh, this is the painful book. To play. <laughs> no, totally. People can tell, yeah, people can tell that you're writing about something that you don't care about. If you don't have skin in the game, if, if I sat there and write about stuff that I did not give a damn about, you would know it. Whoever's reading would know it. I think you just mentioned, if I heard right, you're doing two things at once that are very opposite. Do you often have more than one thing kind of in progress? Oh, well, I always am. Yeah, I always am. Um, I have dozens of projects in my hard drives that are half completed, full completed things that maybe don't make sense with my career now. I have an entire book, Save the Way, that I was looking at the other day about a woman who, it was written when I found out my boyfriend was cheating on me. And it's about a, a writer, a female writer, who finds out her husband's cheating on her and just loses her mind and like starts to ruin his life. It's called resentment. But um, I'm, I'm always writing, and some things don't make sense at one time, so I, I put it away. But yeah, I my brain doesn't stop, and it's kind of... A problem, but not a problem. If you know. <laughs> it's good that the ideas keep coming. And I'm always impressed with somebody who can kind of pop around projects like that. I'm sadly one of those people who has to finish the project I'm on for the most part. Well, you have a personal life, and I don't, so it's a trade-off. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd be that way even if I didn't have the personal life. I think it's the way that I'm wired, unfortunately. But uh, So you are headed to GRL this year. For the very first time, I am. Yeah, I'm in Virginia. I'm excited. Uh, what got you into in, into coming this year? Well, I've done book signings since the beginning. Um, I I find that it really I'm really touched to sort of meet pe meeting people in real life is different from social media interaction. Both are great, but to meet people in real life and see that they enjoy your books and that they might have been touched by your books or something, it's a different level of interaction and it's very energizing. Like I, um, I keep clothes hanging in my closet, like certain outfits from certain book signings just cause I, I feel like I just like to remember it and I like to have mementos. Um, but yeah, so I always have book signings and this one was just a book signing that fit into the whole gay crowd. So yeah, I'm excited. That would be cool. It's going to be fun to meet you there kind of in person now that we've had the cyber introduction. Yeah, I'll buy you a drink just for talking your ear off. <laughs> That's part of the fun of the whole podcast thing, is talking the ear off. Uh, what's coming up next for you? Uh, as you as you pop around all these books, do you know kind of what's coming out next that folks can look forward to? Well, I know that um, I hit a bumpy few weeks in my own life, so I'm, I really want to write happy stuff right now, focus on happy stuff. 
I'm doing a um, series based in my hometown called Jack's Beach. Um, it's a perfect little beachy ocean town in Florida, and I'm uh, basing a new series off of like a bunch of gays that I know and just a bunch of stories that I have. But it's all set here, and it's very like kind of upbeat and sort of what you want a summer read to be. You know, you don't want to sit down and read about death in the summer, so. They're basically designed to be like dishy and fun and maybe a little bit campy and just uh, entertainment. So that's that's my next thing. I don't. I definitely. I'm very dragged down if I'm writing emotional stuff. I get. I'm very affected by it mentally. So I want to write some happy, slutty stuff. Happy and slutty. That's that's a good mix. Good combination. Any idea when we might see those come out? Um, well, I just had to pay a lot of money for this little girl to. Uh, get dealt with at the vet, so probably soon. Sorry, uh, it, it's sad that that is the reason they're coming soon, but something good to look forward to. And hopefully she's doing well. I've seen some of that uh, information on, on she's Facebook. Fine now, she's fine now. She's, uh, she's my fag head, so. She likes she's being just, in daddy's lap. Yeah, she does. For the for the people who are not on the video, you're missing this this dog looked lovingly up at Seth as he pets her head. It's, it's adorable. Oh, no, she just likes attention. She knows she's on camera now. That's the bottom, the bottom line is that she knows she's being seen and she loves it. And she just, she's like her dad. She wants to be seen. <laughs> What's the best way for people to keep up with you online so they can check out all your new books and the ones you've already uh, I post I post way too much on Facebook, uh, probably Facebook. I don't post on Instagram. I find that it's boring. Um... And I, I like Twitter a little bit. All I do is kind of attack Donald Trump on there. But um, basically any social media. Perfect. We will give people links to your uh, your website and your social media and to all the books that we've talked about, too, so people can check those out if they haven't already. Sweet. Seth, thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you in October at GRL. Thank you very much for having me. I, uh, I'll be there. I'm excited. And... Um, Hopefully, I will meet a lot of people who I only know from social media. I'm excited about that. Thank you once again to Seth for joining us on this week's show. Yeah, it was it was really great to talk to him, especially to find out his a little bit of his process and how he he has all these ideas that he just works on all the time and then turns out these 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 wonderful books. Yeah. So I think that'll do it for this week's episode. Coming up next week in episode 142, we are going to visit Sacramento's Lavender Library. Yeah, that was really a delight to get the tour of the library and hear a little bit about its history and what it what it does in this community. Yes, fantastic. So please, everyone, tune in next week. Guys, remember, no matter where life takes you, the journey will always be sweeter when you have a book. Until next time, please, everyone, keep turning those pages and keep reading. For detailed show notes and the complete episode backlist, go to BigGayFictionPodcast.com. New episodes are available every Monday on all major podcast distributors and YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.